uh, we are lucky to have all the stalwarts and the pioneers of different techniques. I keep one of my uh, favorite pioneers and comes up with all new things. And Patrick and Dr. Amar, who's taught me so many things. Uh, I'll start with my presentation. I'll be speaking on a topic which is something that I've uh, been enjoying uh, for the last few years that uh, it was invented by Dr. Amar and described by him for the first time. And it's really made life very, very simple for us. And the applications have been amazingly growing. We'll be doing a few of these later in the program today. I'll be only showing you the basic technique of the single pass uh, fourth row pupilloplasty. And uh, that will then take you on to a couple of other new innovations, which uh, Dr. Amar and a couple of other people will be describing. So uh, I wanted to show you a few videos and uh, here, um, we have this situation where there is a traumatic cataract. You can see that there is subluxation and there is a penetrating injury somewhere at uh, about 11 o'clock, strand of vitreous coming here. And there is, of course, an iris defect, which is not visible with some traumatic mitriasis. So uh, how we decided to go about this was to, we, we were planning to do a femto-assisted cataract surgery so that the subluxation does not increase. Uh, we could have easily done a regular surgery as well, but uh, since uh, it was possible to do a femto-assisted and that always helps in subluxated cataracts because your lens remains uh, less more stable and you know, you're know you putting for less forces on the zonules. So if you have the option of doing a femto-assisted surgery in subluxated cataracts, it's always nice. This was a softish cataract, so it was uh, out in a jiffy. And uh, once you have the lens in, then remains the task of uh, repairing the iris. So the single pass fourth through pupilloplasty, which uh, uh, we will be utilizing here, and I will showing I'll be showing you the basic techniques and the uh, you know the correct technique, and then some of the fallacies where you can go wrong, so that uh, everybody gets a way of doing it very nicely and alertly at home. Those of you who are still not doing it. So of course the cataract is out and let me take you to the situation where we put in the lens now. And once the lens is nicely there and then we are trying to put in pilocarp to see if the pupil constraints, it does not. So we decide to do a single pass fourth row pupiloplasty. So uh, this is one of my first videos. That's why you can see that I'm taking the 10 zero proline needle uh, aided by a small you know, instrument to direct it as there. But frankly, you don't need this. You don't even need an MVR entry now. You can actually just go in straight with a with the 10 zero proline needle through the cornea because you don't really need a port there but to come out you can use a second uh, needle the 26 gauge bent needle through a paracentesis and then hold the iris now the key is to hold the iris with one of these uh, nice forceps you can use i'm using the mst micro graspers but you can use almost any good iris holding forceps which are less traumatic the trick is to get a bite which is sufficient and it is right at the place where you want to put in the suture. Now, sometimes you can go wrong. I'll be showing you later in this video how you can go wrong in either taking too big a bite or too small a bite. Now, here we passed a railroading technique of the 10 zero proline passing through the iris with the 26 gauge and then out. Now, all you have to do here is to pull out a loop of this 10 zero proline from inside using any small uh, you know, manipulator or a uh, aisle dialer. And uh, you can then get this out of the paracentesis. And once it is out of the paracentesis, you form a loop. And then the free end of the suture is passed four times. And you have to remember to pass it the same way each time. You know, you pass one pass and then you do a second pass in the same direction. So essentially, you are basically making four passes. Now, it's very, very important to do the four passes and not, uh, you know, a single pass four throws. So basically this is working out as four throws, but you're basically uh, making four kind of, uh, you know, four loops over the suture and then pulling it. Now, if you make three, it is likely to get loose and, you know, it might just come off. If you make more than four, you are just getting a thicker knot. Four is just fine and it almost never gives way. And then you can just go in closer there. So it's like a slip knot. You just have to pull on the free ends on both the sides. And as you pull on the free ends, the knot tightens up, goes inside and it tightens perfectly in place. And you can see you get a perfect pupil. This was another situation where we were having a traumatic mitriasis again. And uh, I'll run faster now because you've already seen one of the videos. So here we've got going in with a 26 gauge needle, holding the uh, iris with the, with the forceps, and then the second pass with a 26 gauge needle, railroading in and passing the 26 gauge out, and then pulling a loop out as we showed in the first one. But here we'll be doing things a little differently. Uh, we have the loop out now, and once that loop is out from the paracentesis, you pass you pass a single pass through with four throws. Essentially, you're passing this four times through that loop in the same direction. 
and then you just pull on it. It's a slip knot. It goes nicely. Now you'll be wondering why I've left behind that thing, that opening there. So we will be coming back to tackle it. So we have the first knot. You can do it as many times as you want. If you have a very big pupil, you can actually do it three or four times. It doesn't take much time. It's very controlled. And here we've then cut the knot. And then I will go and pass one more suture. Again, the same technique. So I'll just rush through this. We pass it again. Bring it out from the other side, paracentesis, railroad it. Then you pass a slip knot by making the four passes, four throws, and then that's the loop. And then one pass, second pass, third pass, and the fourth pass. And then you just pull the free end on both sides and your knot is there. So we have a perfect knot here, but I'm not too happy about this open thing here. So this uh, thing requires another one. So let me take you, the technique remains the same. We've managed it and we've now managed to close it. We have a fairly good looking eye over here and this does it. Now, Showing you the animation, I borrowed this from Dr. Amar, and uh, this really oh, makes it very, very There's easy. proximal iris where you enter. So once you do this, you can, it shows you very nicely, and it makes like you know things much more clear that you've made these uh, one from one side. We are going to pass the proximal end with, with the ten zero proline, and uh, that that's where the ten zero proline goes through. This these are these iris defects or traumatic mydriasis. There are so many situations which might need it, a coloboma, and a lot of other places. So that's the second one, and that's the 26 gauge from the distal iris. There we have a paracentesis in place. We pass the 10 0 proline, the railroad it through the 26, and we come out. And uh, I remember the time when Dr. Amar uh, invented this, and for the first time we were sitting in Jaipur for an RSI meeting, and he showed me this video on his phone, and I was thrilled to see it because I'd always struggled to get these things right. And I came back, and uh, that few days later, I managed to do my first case, and it came out perfectly. So this is what you can see. There are the four, uh, you know, parts of the thread now. And uh, this is the third one, which is between the defect and then the fourth part, and then the final part over there. And uh, all you have to do is now, basically, as we showed in the previous technique, we just get pull this loop out. The animation makes it easier to understand. Just hold it. You can do it with the forceps. You can do it with a dialer or Lester's hook. And then you can you know, just do the same thing as we saw before, four, four times you pass it through that loop which you've formed for the loop which you have pulled out. And once you've done that four exact times, please make sure that it's four times and neither less nor more. And then it works best and you have this in place and it works beautifully. So I think that shows it. I'll finish by showing you a small situation where we got stuck and I'll just show this in 10, 15 seconds so that uh, you can benefit from my mistakes. This was one of the cases where one of our uh, my, my colleagues was operating and uh, I told him to go ahead and do this for me. Uh, he wanted to learn the technique. We did a good job with the cataract and see that big defect there. And uh, the mistake we are making now is that we've held it too close. So what's going to happen is while, so here you can see I'm passing the ten zero proline needle and passing it out over there. And now we are going to try and get this out the other side, holding it and getting the loop out. The problem that happened is first, the two problems which happened and which are basically the take home messages. We got the loop out nicely. First thing you'll notice is as I'm going to tighten this, the pupil is going to be too small. So it's better to initially have a slightly bigger pupil forming and then you can always come back if you think it's too small. So this is giving us almost a pinhole. Now the second problem that happened was that my needle ten zero proline passed through the cornea, the lip of the wound. So now I'm stuck because I can't tighten the knot. So I'm having a situation and I'm cutting it. So anyway, these are these take home messages from here and I think I've already spoken enough. So I like to delink my presentation. I hope my message was clear and we'll have much more coming for you after this from all the top speakers. Uh, thank you so much. So thank you Gaurav for that great presentation and there are a lot of questions which I think we'll take it in the end. And now I would request our second speaker, Dr. Priya Narang, who's a stalwart in the field of the uh, iris repair and she's going to be speaking on iridodialysis repair, true fold and trocar assisted. Uh, hello. hello. Thank, you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nandra. Can I read this as I hope uh, my voice is clear. Yes, your voice is clear. Uh, yeah. Carry on. So, yeah, uh, I begin my talk with the iridodialysis repair, and I'll be covering up the twofold and the trocar assisted repair. So, uh, uh, going with this, uh, whenever we have iridodialysis, the first thing that we actually do is, you know, we need to assess uh, the degree of iridodialysis that we have. 
So we all know iridodialysis is the disinsertion of the iris from its root. So it can be, uh, we have broadly categorized it clinically as uh, massive, where it might be more than 120 degrees, it might be moderate, or it might be a minimal kind where, you know, you can uh, just get away by doing a minimal uh, intervention. So basically when we have uh, these categories of uh, uh, differentiation, uh, which is done clinically, we decide the kind of procedure that we actually want. And actually, you know, when we have uh, severe traumatic cases and all, it's not just that uh, a simple iridodialysis repair in itself would suffice. At times you also need to reconstruct the pupil in these cases, you know, because uh, there is so much of damage uh, which has already happened. So for this, basically the uh, technique that we use is the non-oppositional repair, which has been described by Dr. Snyder at all. And uh, uh, for pupil reconstruction, we try to use a single pass for through pupiloplasty. And when we try to combine these two procedures, uh, we call this as a two-fold technique. And we just happened to publish this in 20, uh, 2018. This is just a suggested reading uh, for people who would like to go back and uh, go through this technique uh, clinically. So uh, basically now I'll just try to show you this uh, animation. Now, when you have, this is a case where you can see there's a uh, maximum iridodialysis here. So this is, uh, in this case, what we'll be just trying to do with a non-oppositional uh, repair would be, uh, we will take a 9 or a 10 or What we need is a double arm suture for this. This is just for beginners who are just trying to venture into uh, iris repair techniques that you need a double arm for doing an iridodialysis repair with a non-oppositional. So I'll just run through this video here. Uh, we have just taken a double arm suture and it has passed through uh, the periphery of the iris. Now, this is very important that the amount of the iris tissue that you actually engage into the needle. So uh, you need to do this through the entire circumference of where you have an iris disinsertion. Now, actually what I'm trying to say here is that whenever you're trying to do this, you know, or often uh, this iris tissue is, um, uh, 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 it might be fragile. So it might not be always possible for you to pass the needle from where actually you have planned to pass it. At times, you might need to take a bigger bite or a lesser bite. So depending on that, in the post-operative period, what you can get is the correctopia. That is what you are seeing here. Now, what you're seeing here is the updrawn pupil, although your iridodialysis repair has been done. So when we have cases like this, you know, uh, we just try to do a single pass for through pupiloplasty, then just try to close down the pupil from uh, either side and try to get a round pupil in this. So this is what the two-fold technique actually is all about. This animation was just to explain how to go ahead with the procedure. This is a single pass four throw. Uh, four throws have been taken through a single loop. You just slide it inside and then you cut it off and you get through that. So going uh, from this to the clinical uh, video that I'll just try to show you, this is a case of a traumatic uh, iridodialysis. There's a maximum more than 270 degrees of iridodialysis that you see here. So just trying to reposit this iris tissue inside. So you can see the entire iris tissue, it's totally fragile and uh, barely it is impossible to do this. But then with a lot of patience and grit, when you try to go ahead with this and you're trying to reposit this iris tissue out here, you know, you just create a sterile groove, try to pass through the periphery, come up and you tie it up into the sterile groove where you have done this. Now, what you see here is the irregular pupil uh, here. There's a missing iris tissue here because this is a traumatic iridodialysis. So you do not have an iris tissue actually here in this case. So then what you try to do is that the areas where it is deficient, you try to go ahead by doing a pupiloplasty procedure. All this uh, said and done, you have to be very careful while doing these surgical interventions because it's a fragile tissue, especially if it is a traumatic case. Secondly, what is important is to do the surgical procedure under fluid infusion because these are complicated cases. You might even choose an OVD to do that. That's not an issue, but it all depends upon the kind of problem that the patient has had at that point of time. So as you see here, continuous repair is going on. You're trying to reconstruct a functional pupil. That is what I would try to say. It's not a cosmetic kind of thing, but it's a functional pupil that you're trying to create here, trying to give functionality of uh, vision to the patient in the post-operative period. So that is the aim for this, how to do that. So having uh, said and uh, described this uh, procedure that you see, this is the uh, post-operative image of the case, although, uh, um, but uh, if you compare this with a pre-operative image, uh, you know, it's, it's just wonderful because uh, it was totally like there was no scope of getting an iris repair done in this case. So coming back to the same thing, I would go ahead with one more animation. There are different ways to build the cat. You might initially go ahead with an iridodialysis repair and then go ahead. 
Now, what I'm trying to show in this animation is that you have an additive dialysis repair, okay? So what we try to do, and uh, alternatively, if it's some minimal to moderate kind of thing, what we try to do is that first, you can close down this big iris defect. So because, you know, when you, are, you will be doing a non-oppositional repair, first thing is you have to come from the opposite side and you'll try to reposit this. Maybe one, uh, at least you might need for this amount of iridal dialysis at least two passes. Now, uh, you can even close down this defect. I'll just run this animation, uh, sorry. I think I need to go back. Okay, so this is it. Uh, we're trying to do a single pass here. So what will happen, this iris tissue is going to come close to uh, each other. And then, you know, you do a non-oppositional repair. So it is just that it's just a, uh, another way of uh, doing it. So you can just uh, bring down this area of iridodialysis by doing this. So you can go ahead with this. You can see this, the same thing in the clinical video, the animation, uh, the animation the animation was made accordingly. So now what you see here clinically is that you have an iridodialysis here and you're trying to do that. So just trying to uh, cover up the peripheral iris surface, trying to just do a single pass photofibroplasty here so that you know actually you decrease the area uh, where you would be needing an iridodialysis repair. And once having done this, uh, uh, the advantage of uh, doing this is that we usually adopt a single pass in doing, actually you can do any pupiloplastic procedure of your choice. There are so many of them. Uh, we try to do this because it's simple. Uh, you can wind up the surgery uh, uh, fast. There is minimal, minimal anterior chamber manipulation. You need not uh, uh, go again into the anterior chamber to achieve a knot at that particular point for that particular point. So you might uh, finish, finish it off with minimal passes in the anterior chamber. So this is the same thing which uh, I showed before in the animation that you have done this. These are the scissors, micro scissors that go inside and you cut down the knot. And then you can go ahead with an animal suture. This is a non-oppositional repair as described. And um, this is again a double arm suture which is taken up. So you just engage the periphery of the iris tissue. You have to be very careful of not engaging the corneal tissue here. This is the most essential thing. Otherwise your loop does not slide inside. So that is one thing which uh, I think all the surgeons need to be very careful about. And uh, otherwise it can lead to failure of the procedure and you might have to just cut it off and again do that entire procedure. So this is again a combination of um, the single pass and uh, the uh, uh, non-oppositional repair that is going on once the pupil reconstruction has been done thoroughly and you're satisfied with achieving the kind of functionality and the cosmetic thing that you need for the pupil, you are done through that. So this is just a repetition of what is going on. And uh, in the end, what you try to achieve is a round pupil, which serves very well its purpose and what it is designed to be. So uh, coming up to the main aspect of doing any pupil, uh, pupil repair, iris repair procedure is not to imbibe the corneal tissue while sliding inside that. So for that particular reason, we try to came up with this trocar assisted handbag repair. Now, uh, the concept is to prevent entrapment of the corneal tissue into the suture needle. And what you uh, need in this is that you need either a 25 gauge trocar that we commonly used. Uh, we commonly use for posterior segment surgeries. You can do that, or there is a specially designed trocar anterior chamber maintainer. You can even use that. Uh, you can introduce it into the anterior chamber. Coming up to this, I'll just show you this animation and I'll just try to show you the concept. Uh, which goes behind this procedure is that, I'll just pause this here for a second. This is the trocar which is introduced inside and it's not in the posterior chamber, but it is in the anterior chamber. The concept being that when you have placed this trocar here, you have this tunnel which is going on in and your suture needle passes through this. So when your suture needle passes through this, there is lesser chance of imbibing of the corneal tissue. As we saw in the previous uh, video, I think Dr. Gaurav had also showed, you know, you have to be very careful and he used a rod. Even I use it many times, you know, uh, if you have that thing, uh, the, uh, the uh, fear of having it, uh, of having the, uh, the corneal tissue into your suture needle, uh, you need to create a clear passage from where you can pass. So you just came up with this and this actually provides you as a leverage, as an anchorage, and you can pass your needle through this. Now, the second thing that anybody would like to tell me is that, how do you get to assess the amount of iridodialysis that you'll be doing? Because like in case, if you have a big iridodialysis, how do you do that with this? Because you need the leverage of this needle from the stroke arm. The point is that this is through the corneal incision and you can just twist this around a little bit here and there. 
And then you can seal this uh, incision with the stroma hydration that we usually do in our fecal emulsification procedures. So th that's not a very big issue out here. So I think this is, this is one tip which uh, people can use if they are facing this difficulty and you can see how beautifully the suture slides into its place. This is a clinical demonstration of the same thing. You take up a trocar, this is a retinal trocar. The only thing that you need to be careful about is, you know, it has a very long blade and you have to be very careful. It does not hit into the corneal tissue. So that uh, is something which is uh, uh, very, um, uh, you have to be careful about. And for that, we have designed a specially designed trocar anterior chamber maintainer, which has a shorter uh, tunnel, you know, and the needle actually is also shot up. So it does not uh, uh, damage the corneal tissue. So now this is the clinical video, what you're uh, seeing here, the suture, the double arm suture is sliding. The first uh, suture has passed on. This is the second thing that is going inside. And this is the second arm. So now you can see how it slides inside, the loop goes inside, and then uh, you know from, the, from your tunnel, wherever you have created, it comes out and then you can uh, just titrate the amount of tissue that you really want to pull, and then you can, uh, uh, you know, from the, from your tunnel wherever you have created, it comes out, and then you can uh, just titrate the amount of tissue that you really want to pull, and then you can. Uh, uh, Argentinian friends, Juret Zavalia was the greatest Argentinian ophthalmologist, but this patient does not have glaucoma. But remember, there is photometriasis there. So I pass the needle inside, and look from the other side is a 30 gauge needle. I've railroaded the two. Once I've railroaded the two, you can see now the loop coming out there. Once that comes out through the paracentesis, I'll bring the loop out. So once I have brought this loop out, how do I bring this out? I bring the suture to the center, go in with the forceps and pull it out. See, that's a simpler way. You can bring it out through a dialer or something, but sometimes you can get stuck in your incision. Here you can see now, once that's done four times, I've done it, I will pull it and finish it. Now, let's take this difficulty to the closed angle glaucoma. Because when you see uret zavalia like this, you can have uret zavalia without glaucoma, or you can have uret zavalia with glaucoma. So that's why I wanted to cover closed angle glaucoma. But look at in this case, pre op, post op. Now, let's take this difficulty in a PK patient. In this patient, watch what I show you the next is the anterior segment OCT. Look at the iris, it is stuck to the cornea endothelium there. These Pressures will be 30, 40, it's crazy levels. Now, question is, what do you do? You can do a trap, you can do a valve, something like that. But what we published in the European Journal was this, that with photopuplasty, I'm going to bring that iris down. Once I bring my pupil down, I've broken all those sinicae and I made a closed angle into an open angle. So now you see, if you have too much of closed angle, you can do six points fixation. If you have less, you can do a four point fixation. Either way, the principle is simple. I am making my anatomy normal. That's all I'm doing. I am not making a new drainage procedure. So I've got fluid in the eye. This is a trocar AC maintainer. So in this, I've got fluid passing always through the eye. The reason again, I tell you fluid is this sinicae will be there. When you break the sinicae, bleeding will happen. If you play with viscoelastic, you can always put viscoelastic in the middle anytime you want, but the fluid washes away the Hyphema. Now look what I've done. I'm bringing my pupil down, doing the four pass through pupiloplasty, and you'll see now. Once I have pulled it in, see my pupil coming down to normal size. With that coming down, my angle will open. My pressure will become normal. Look at the anterior segment OCT on your right screen, and you see not only the intraocular pressure has come down, the vision has improved, and the anterior segment OCT has drastically changed. Now look at this for retinal people. I wanted to also tell you this. It's an important thing because they have silicon oil in the eye. And a lot of retinal surgeons might be watching this webinar. Look at this. Again, the peripheral eye is, is stuck there. In this case, if you remove the oil, the pressure will not come down. So what you do is you refer it to a glaucoma surgeon for something. But instead, if you just do this procedure where you can see the preoperative and the post-op picture, anterior segment OCT, and you can see how different the game is. Finally, what I want to tell you all is that we are also having this new book of hours, which is coming out. I don't know if you're getting the image on the screen there. Are you seeing that? No, we are no, not, we are not seeing, seeing it. it. No. No. Oh, it's not coming. Why is it not coming then? No. Oh, I have to again stop and start again. Stop, stop and share again. Okay. And then share screen. Oh, first on the thing. Now, 
one minute. Now it's okay. Are you seeing it now? Yeah, yeah, it's coming. Okay, this is the new book which is just coming out by us uh, in September, which will be coming out by Slack. And I thought I'll show you one more thing is uh, which uh, uh, number I will talk to you about later on is on the ophthalmic Premier League, which is there on Tuesday, which will be telecast at 6:30, which will be an international webinar on a very interesting thing of international ophthalmic Premier League. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amar, uh, for those very complex cases in which you did uh, aerodialysis repair and also did a pupilloplasty for single pass uh, for throw pupilloplasty to to not only correct uh, issues of the iris but also the issues of the cornea. And uh, I'm going to be inviting the next uh, speaker, who is uh, Dr. Ashwin Agarwal, and again he's going to be dealing with a very complex situation, and that is iris repair in complicated conditions. So Ashwin, can you share your screen? Yes, I will. Hi all, I hope you are able to see my screen. Yes. I'm starting the play. If you can see it play, let me know. Is it playing? It's playing. Okay, so uh, is it full screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I wanted to share with you some of the complicated cases. And I think in uh, this was a knifing injury which a patient had come to me with. And I thought it's very important to uh, show you guys how to deal with such scenarios. Uh, in which steps or what is the methodology involved in it. So let's just start with uh, pretty much what I did in this case. This was a bad trauma where I have just three points of attachment, one in uh, one on top, a broader based uh, attachment on top, a smaller inferior attachment and one which is attached into the corneal wound itself. Now there are two choices here is one is to do a PK itself or I can first repair the iris, first put an IOL in place, the cataractus lens was removed in the primary surgery itself. Uh, so let's start dealing with the complex scenario of actually dealing with the IOL. In, in order to deal with the IOL issue over here, I am using a glued IOL technique over here. I've made my flaps and I'm, not, I'm avoiding most of the steps over here. I'm putting an iris hook in place because I need to see visualization. Just the central three millimeters is enough for me uh, if I get that. I am placing my lens, externalized one haptic with the handshake technique. And if you see, I'm not actually holding the second haptic. This was a trick taught by uh, Dr. Priya Narang itself. No assistant uh, glued dial. And now I'm basically externalizing both the haptics. I have now been able to uh, tuck my haptic into the Gebauer Chariot's tunnel. Once this uh, is done, now I have to tackle my iris repair. Now, as uh, I think Dr. Abhay said it very nicely, if you shouldn't try it if you cannot manage it. But in this case, the patient was a very non-affording one. And I didn't have a choice but to go ahead and try at least and repair whatever I could. And hence, doing a hangback technique over here was the first option. So hangback technique, both double arm proline suture taken, making a scleral ridge, going on one side and pulling it apart, ensuring that I'm securing that knot into the scleral ridge over there. Making a second ridge because that counter traction over here will help me doing a pupilloplasty at the end. Now, this was a very important step over here, which uh, a lot of us might miss. Now, if I did this without doing the first second handbag, uh, I would actually lose this uh, traction, which I would have had. So first, I'm doing a hangback, hangback, uh, and now do a pupilloplasty repair. The second one, my heart was in my mouth, but I still had to proceed ahead and go ahead and try and attempt to close that gaping uh, optic which I could see of the IOL. And fortunately for me in this case, I was lucky to get away with this. I did not have to do a PK at that point of time. Probably in the next one, two years, I'm going to follow up this patient and see if we need to do a penetrating keratoplasty. This was the post-op one week of the same case. Uh, vision improved drastically and was very, very happy. I'll show you another case which uh, explains a little bit more on the methodology that I use pretty much in these traumatic conditions. I hope I'm, is it uh, visible? Yes, yes, it is. Okay, sorry. Okay, so this case basically had a corneal tear, uh, sphincter tear, there was a iris stromal tear and an iridodialysis. Along with that, there also was a traumatic cataract and an anterior posterior capsule that was torn. I'm not... In interest of time, I'm not going to show you the cataractus part. Uh, I'm going to dive in, just going to show you steps, what probably were involved. The cataract, uh, the, uh, the capsule was broken over here. So I basically did whatever I could with the capsule and uh, removed it. 
uh, fortunately there was a very little uh, very little uh, uh, very soft cataract over there and that came out very easily but the posterior capsule itself was broken and hence i had to and the sheen of the bag if you see the sheen of the bag it was not very good to place an intraocular lens in any case so i actually went ahead and did an anterior vitrectomy in this case from using the trocars uh, uh, the trocar only for the infusion but using the glue dial uh, sclerotomies for my anterior vitrectomy now i'm placing my lens in this case externalizing both the haptics just like how i did in the previous case because i have my central 3 mm of pupil open i'm not really worried about the iris at this point of time but now i really have to as uh, dr priya said you have to sit and analyze these situations as and when you're doing them so now what do we have here what are the steps that could be involved i cannot do a hang back first in this case because i don't know where to do the hang back because i have a pupil tear i also have an iridodialysis i also have an iris stromal tear so that's there's a full cut over there along with an iridodialysis so what i really am doing is first attaching my root if i have my root in place then i can attach the hang back or i can attach an iridodialysis so first what I, this is not the leaf of the pupil this is the leaflet of the root of that iris so now i'm doing a, a single pass four through for the uh, root of the iris is what i'm trying to do here if you see methodically what i'm trying to do is first attach the root once my root is attached re sit and analyze the situation again because you don't know where you're going to be able to make that uh, iridodialysis repair you also have a 5 clock hour iridodialysis i'm using my glue dial to do my hand back i don't really need a ridge i don't need a tunnel or anything like that i'm using the base of that flap itself to actually do my hand back technique over here now again two proline sutures uh, uh, through a corneal wound on the opposite side a paracentesis you can use a trocar as dr amar and uh, dr priya had described before and once we are done with this we basically cover that uh, suture not with the flap but is this case over i feel that that optic was actually disturbing me at many levels so i really went back ahead because these pupil leaflets were actually still left aside and the methodology here is step 1 step 2 step 3 were very different in each of the cases what i really want to show you guys is the method may be different but the approach has to be that you really need to sit and analyze each of these cases uh, one by one before you go and solve them the idea here is basically now you see the end of this case this is post op day 1 i want to show you the post op day 3 and here is a 3 week post op the patient was exceptionally well was 20 30 vision wanted to show you one last case which was very very a sewing machine technique which was taught earlier by dr ravi kumar i hope my uh, screen is clear and visible the video is playing yes yes okay. yes So here is an iridodialysis. The case basically came to me with a phaco wound uh, of the root of the iris that was through the phaco that just dragged the iris. And many times it happens; it can happen to any one of us as well. So there's a cataractous lens inside. But first things first, I know that there is an iridodialysis there. I'm making a scleral ridge on one side, and I'm making a. I'm first ensuring that my cataract comes. Up. This was a young, younger patient, so I didn't have to actually use high power or anything like that. I use my normal technique. Just place an iris hook in place so that the iris doesn't come in the phaco probe. That's the only trick I will tell you for removing the cataractous lens. If you don't have a posterior capsule or the anterior capsule rupture, if you don't have any of the bag-related complications, then just go ahead and place your lens in place. Now start attacking the uh, pupil repair. So first, once you get this in place. now let me talk about the apparatus now first i'm just releasing that to ensure that that's where the iridodialysis the apparatus that i use here is a 26 gauge needle and a ninoproline i thread the ninoproline through the 26 gauge needle and pass it all the way through and now i use the opposite side paracentesis and showing this through an animation if you can see this very clearly go through the iris root come out through the scleral ridge If you want to make a pocket that's fine it's uh, i all are fine with me go out don't come out of the eye just go again through the iris root and come out and make a loop make a second loop as much as required in every case as much as you want now cut between the loops and remove the excess sutures that you don't need tie 
switch over 1 to 2, 3 to 4. As you can see over here, 1 to 2 is tied down and 3 to 4. Now there are other versions of the same technique where you can pass it through, uh, through and through. And I, I can show you those on a separate chat, but right now, just for the viewing of this, I think it's easier to understand it over here, how the sewing machine technique works. This is a live case. That's the free end. Now you get a loop and then you pass it again through the iris and come out through the scleral ridge to give you a second loop. Once you have these two loops in place, this is how it will look. Your free end and two loops, you cut in between the loops. You cut in between the loops to get this pattern and now you go crisscross. So you basically are crisscrossing one to two, three to four. Again, I'll show this in an animation, so you don't worry. Even if you're not able to see the sutures very clearly over here, the animation kind of picture kind of explains it. And here you are, the crisscross pattern. And that's pretty much the end of the case because now you have a suture that's tied down. You can put, uh, do your irrigation aspiration, glue this down into place. And that's the end of the case for this iridodialysis repair. Here are some of the animated pictures that help explanation. Thank you very much all. Thank you, Dr. Namrata, for having me and everybody on the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ashwin. Those were really complex cases uh, which you dealt with. Uh, Thank you, uh, Ashwin. I think uh, there are a couple of questions. We'll have just one or two questions. Uh, Dr. Sohas, uh, um, yeah, the panelists, would you like to say uh, regarding this particular technique, do you think uh, if you're doing a pinhole uh, pupiloplasty, would you want to implant a trifocal or a multifocal lens in these cases? You, uh, you to. have to unmute, unmute yourself, unmute. Admin, can you unmute? Yeah. No, no, it's muted. So has it is muted. Yeah, it was unmute actually. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what I want to say is, now pupiloplasty is a situation that will come for extreme cases. And if I'm putting a trifocal, obviously, uh, to my knowledge, trifocal and pinhole probably will not go together. So, Amar, uh, you were saying that uh, it increases the depth of focus. Really, does it also give some uh, reading ability to the patient uh, if you have done a pinhole pupil? Because if the person has a pinhole, he's, uh, he should have a depth of focus, right? That's correct, Maipal. What happens in these patients is uh, they're able to see distance and near without glasses. So, even if a patient is, let's say, 55 or 60 years of age, the advantage is you don't need a trifocal, as Suhas very correctly said, because or you don't even need a multifocal. So if you are already putting a monofocal into that patient or a toric IUL simple into the patient, the pinhole pupilplasty 1.5 millimeter helps this very well. One issue which many people have been asking and Namrata was telling me people are asking is what about fundus examination? If you do fourth row pupilplasty, the pupil dilates a little bit so you can see the central fundus, etc. You will still be able to see the fundus, perhaps not too much of the periphery. But let's take a worst case scenario. After five years, patient comes to you with a retinal detachment or some problem like that. What do you do? Very simple. All you do is take a YAG laser and shoot and you're back to square one and you'll be able to see it. These patients with high astigmatism are actually very badly blind. The maximum astigmatism I have corrected with this is 26 diopters. So you can imagine a patient with 26 diopters will be practically blind just seeing counting fingers, you know. And they start seeing 618 immediately. Yeah, so actually, Priya, maybe you can pitch in the question. This is a question that everybody asks regarding the pupil. So uh, a patient will come to you with a retinal detachment, but that's when the macula is involved. Uh, in case a patient had uh, some uh, symptoms of flashes and floater, you're not going to do a YAG, I suppose, to uh, cut the suture and look at the periphery of the retina. So under those circumstances, you would obviously miss early lesions, which are peripheral which under normal circumstances one would have uh, been able to pick up. And the second thing is that does it uh, give you a good cosmetic kind of an appearance? Because a person, if he has irregular astigmatism and maybe if you do a, a DALC or some kind of a, a corneal procedure to remove the irregular astigmatism, wouldn't that be more uh, acceptable to the patient rather than doing a pinhole pupiloplasty and obscuring the uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy for uh, a normal day-to-day -day purpose? I think uh, coming up to the first point that you said about the peripheral lesions, uh, I do agree if the patient is symptomatic and if the patient has some retinal issues and uh, the periphery has to be examined, uh, if 
there is a difficulty in examination then obviously we need to uh, get away with that suture and you need to do it because posterior segment involvement is also there coming up to the second point of uh, pinhole pupilloplasty i would suggest uh, the depth of focus that is achieved with pinhole pupilloplasty is simply amazing that has been studied with the clinical trial sleep machine and it ranges from uh, plus 2.5 to minus 2.5 and the outcomes that have come up with ppp are too good so i think that uh, the uh, doing a uh, pinhole pupilloplasty i would i would recommend uh, doing it because the depth of focus that you get is amazing even if you uh, pick up some of the cases uh, for a uh, dalk or what uh, uh, other corneal procedures that you are seeing to replace the tissues but if the central uh, area of the cornea is clear i think ppp doing a pinhole pupilloplasty does make all the sense because you get all the benefits even you get a, an amazing near vision intermediate and a distance vision also Um, my pal can i comment no sure of it yeah i think the the advantage the pin hole will be that it's is in a sort of a reversible way if you do corneal procedure it's not reversible so i think uh, the pin hole has an advantage over other permanent kind of procedure you can always go back and revert back if you need to no no i agree to that the of the procedure is not required if there is a corneal problem the irregular astigmatism is because of a corneal problem so if you are replacing the cornea there is no reversibility that you really required for that uh, and another question that has come is that uh, if you have to make a pupil pin hole would pilocarpin also do the same uh, that's a question oh, or can that be used as a test you know to to tell you pre operatively only What you can do is with a pin hole. See, for example, these patients sometimes are dilated or fixed pupils. So you even if you put a pilocarpine, sometimes it will not come down. Like I showed you in many of those cases, which I showed you on the videos on. So instead of that, with epsilon martin group and through Jack Holliday's idea, we have made now pin hole uh, pin holes of different apertures. So what you do is you can put a pin hole in front of the patient. Everybody in their hospital clinic has the pin holes. Keep a pin hole. Show the patient how they will feel without it. and with it and they'll see a huge difference so that is what will give you an indication it will help coming to the question which mypal the one of the delegates had asked is if i was to do a dalk let's say I'm, there's no scarring there's astigmatism and i want to do a dalk i have seen even with best chance even post dalk you know you have astigmatism problems coming up so let's be real there in this there's no problem here i see the patient in the morning when i do when i see the patient by afternoon or even the next day the patient will start reading 612 to 69 so there are big advantages of it what is the cost is just one suture you know you're not spending on an iul which has got fda problems or i'm talking of the pinhole iuls or a piggy backs so that's the second big advantage okay i think uh, we'll come to the next talk now and the next talk is by dr iqbal ik ahmed i think we all are waiting for his talk and he is going to be talking about circlage pupil repair Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be here. It's Ike Ahmed. I'm calling with you from Toronto. Uh, let me see if I can get my slides to uh, to show here. It's an honor to be here. I want to say hi to everybody in India, as well as around the world that's attending this meeting. Uh, we've been uh, in quarantine, like many of you as well, and this is an opportunity for us to share and to uh, enjoy each other's company. And it's been been great to hear everybody here as well. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ash, Ashwin and others, uh, and Amar and others who invited me here today to be as part of this uh, group. It's an honor to be here, as far as being with AIOS and uh, and also with um, IRRSI as well. Uh, I've been to India once, although my heritage is from India. So, Hamara Urdu Tora Ba Karstakta. That was from Mitch. I hope you understood that. Uh, but I'll be speaking in English here. Uh, I'll be speaking about Sir Claus here. And, Often, sometimes, what is missed when we talk about iris suturing uh, and pupil repairs is what our hand positions are doing, and the holding and the grasping of the instruments, and the twisting and the turning and the flexing of our fingers, uh, really help to ensure that, for example, the needle pass glides freely, and avoids traction to the iris. So, pay attention. I'm just showing this GoPro video just to show. uh the positions of my hands on a patient's eye and when we're tying sutures for example you'll see that uh, the instrumentation in order to place through incisions should be done in a manner that minimizes torquing of the eye and maximizes the fulcrum ability of that incision and therefore holding instruments in a very flat position uh is advisable as you see for example in this video so I just want to just show that 
brief little tip just to talk about a uh, hand position, arm position, uh, and uh, and the uh, uh, incisions management as far as the microimplantation. I also like to plan my surgeries by thinking about my incisions. This is a case, for example, where I've been I was planning on placing a couple of iris prosthesis in the bag for some sectoral loss of iris as well as suturing the iris. And I've planned my incisions considering the long nature of that needle. It is also helpful to have the right instrumentation. We've heard this already many years ago uh, before people were really doing any iris repairs. I found there's a lack of availability of instrumentation and we tried to design instruments that would help to hold the iris or to hold sutures. And we differentiated micro graspers from micro tires. So these are these are different aspects that can be used in terms of managing these difficult cases. Um, in terms of uh, instrumentation like this, micro tire forceps can be used in different ways. Sorry, I, I hope I'm still okay here. Um, You're fine. And I'm going to show a technique here with the called the McAmit technique. Hopefully, can you hear me okay, Ashwin? Are we okay? Yeah, you're good. You're good. That okay. Was, that was I thought I was just talking to myself else. for a, for a few minutes that. there. What we're using basically here is um, is a suturing technique. We're using a micro grasper to grab the iris. We are coming out of the incision, taking a, a Kuglin hook to bring the suture out of the incision. So now we have two ends out of the eye. Very similar to what we've seen with the steep sliding knot and the four throw uh, people plastic we saw earlier. Here we're using the micro tire to actually suture uh, around the uh, short end of the suture, long end of the suture, grabbing the short end, just like we would outside the eye, and then pushing it into the eye. Uh, this is a very reproducible, easy technique to use. There's no worry about looping the sutures and moving the, the suture in and out. It's simply just looping on the sutures very quickly and pushing it into the eye very, very straightforward. And then cinching it down and whether you do a four pass or whether you like to do a locking suture, this can be done. This patient here uh, came to me, had, had a traumatic cataract, an atonic pupil, uh, was wearing multifocal contact lenses and was very keen on uh, getting her cataract out as well as maximizing her depth of focus. In this case, we took the cataract out fairly uneventfully. We put a CTR in. We put a, a pupil um, independent diffractive uh, bifocal lens here, in this case, uh, into the capsular bag. And then we evacuated the viscoelastic elastic because as you know, we're gonna be doing a cerclage here. And we moved the, uh, the, the uh, center of the lens to uh, approximate the visual axis by utilizing the first Purkinje image. And therefore, the, uh, the, you can see the lens is moving a bit, moved a bit nasally here. Uh, for the cerclage technique, it's helpful to ensure the iris is fairly mobile and not sneaked down. And the iris may be a little bit atrophic. However, as long as there's tissue available, we can typically move forward with doing the cerclage. Um, what I want to note here is I've made four incisions to do the cerclage. Well, the main incision and three other incisions. And I'd like to, to note that the forceps here are using are being used to do the work. The needle is held in the anterior chamber, moves forward slightly, while the forceps is actually bringing the iris to the needle tip. And then emerging from the eye very carefully using a docking approach with a cannula to avoid entrapment of the needle in the cornea. It's very helpful to be a bimanual surgeon. Here we're using our left hand to grab the needle, the right hand using the micro grasper. And this is a basting suture technique where basically we're rolling the needle around the, around the iris tissue. This, uh, this creates a more round pupil. And, and for me, it's very important to get a pupil as cosmetically pleasing as possible. I realize sometimes it's difficult when we have missing iris. These surclosh techniques are helpful when there is uniform atonicity of the pupil and there is no specific focal iris defect. If there is, then using a more localized technique with interrupted su multiple sutures may be more advisable or what we call a partial iris or clause may be done. Here now we've emerging through the main incision. We're going to now show the uh, McAmit technique that I showed earlier where we're using a mechanical style suturing outside the eye, but rather than bringing the iris to the incision, we're pushing the knot in. This is perhaps one of the easier suture techniques to do, and it allows us to titrate the tension on the, on the pupil and the iris suture 
uh, quite exquisitely. We can place a micro tire to another incision as well. And I like to adjust the pupil size to about three and a half millimeters in size. Now we'll lock the suture. I have to say, I like to lock the suture. It takes me another uh, 10 seconds to lock the suture, but it really helps me to ensure that that knot will be, will be present and still. And three and a half millimeters does allow good peripheral retinal visualization with scleral indentation or a wide field uh, contactless uh, viewing system in the OR. And there's our pupil present there and we can see the pre and post as well. Now there are conditions like this where we have to consider we also have an iridolysis present as well. And these conditions can also be done and managed with the surclaw suture. Priya very nicely showed various aerodialysis approaches. You can see this is a, just as a little less than 90 degrees uh, in, its, uh, in its size, just under three clock hours. In this case, I should mention this needle I'm using is a straight needle. I prefer to do a straight needle for dialysis repairs going across the AC, going through the sclera just behind the blue zone and the white zone here, as you see, present. And I'm using a docking technique here to dock the needle. This is an STC6 Ethicon needle, which docks nicely with a 27 gauge hypodermic needle. Double arm suture, again, going through the same incision. In this case, I was able to place one mattress suture. Keep in mind where the suture is exiting because it does help us to, to exit over a larger arc length on the outside of the eye than when we enter inside the eye because we have a larger circumference and therefore it stretches the iris out. We then tie the suture, and I'm gonna do a slip knot here because we know we still have to manage the uh, pupil here, and the slip knot allows us to titrate the tension because the concern is here after we, uh, we do the uh, surclage, we may loosen the suture or it may break. So in this case, we just did a slip knot. Now here, we do the, here we're gonna do a surclage technique again. I, I like to start nasally, and this is a CIF4 curved needle from Ethicon is what I use. Uh, this, is a, is a, this needle allows us to pass through the AC and come out through the cornea easily. Uh, and this taper cut uh, is, is nice to place through the pupil as opposed to the spatula. And we are now rolling the suture again in a basing tile style technique uh, to, uh, to basically create more of a rolling suture. I should mention this is more of a rolling suture rather than a basting, to basting technique. Basting would be in and out. Uh, this is rolling. The rolling approach allows us to uh, create a nice round pupil. So again, we're just going to go each, we're going to divide up the pupil in four quadrants. We, we have done the infranasal. Supranasal is going to be done now. We come out of the eye and then we go back in again to do the supratemporal and the supranasal, so the infratemporal. And now we have a complete uh, purse string suture. Uh, Iris surclage and pupil surclage to me is one of the most elegant but, but perhaps taxing techniques. It requires us to optimize closed system techniques as well as respecting the nature of the fulcrum in managing instrumentation through small incisions. Uh, we are now using again the McAhmed technique, which is basically again tying outside the eye and pushing it in. And we'll try to get the tension carefully to again get the right pupil size. And once we're happy with that, we'll lock the knot as we said, simply to basically do a reverse throw, lock it in, and then we will lock our, our iridodialysis suture to ensure that uh, we have tension that's achieved and roll and rotate it on into the eye. And then we have, there's our post-operative appearance and we have a fairly reasonable round pupil. Uh, one last thing I'm gonna mention is that cases like this are not amenable to iris or collage. And these patients require us to also reposition the pupil. We do multiple um, sutures here to close the defect. But what I like to do is I like to use an endodiathermy. In this case, it's a 23 gauge cautery, bipolar cautery attached to my phaco machine. And by the way, I'm just showing here an intraocular tying suturing technique. You can also use the micro tires inside the other suture as well. And we're going to use uh, the cautery here to move the pupil. This is incredible. This is really a great way to reshape the pupil, make it round again. When you have finished your pupiloplasty and the pupil looks straight at an edge, take the small cautery and round it out. This will create, again, a more cosmetic, pleasing pupil, which I think to our patients is very important. And you can see we just close that defect. But you see, you'll notice that there's still a bit of a straight edge present on the temporal side. And when I, after I lock the knot, I'm going to place a little bit of cautery just in the area temporally as you'll see here, 
to create a nice round pupil. So that's one option you can do. We're trying to recreate the pupil and we've been able to do a lot of different manipulation in this as well to see the pre and post operative picture. So those are my, my slides. I want to thank everybody. We'll see you uh, around at more and more webinars. We've probably been seeing each other more than we normally do. But I look forward to the day we can actually see each other in person and give each other a hug and, and high five. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. I.K. Ahmed. And again, there are a lot of questions which we will take in the end. And the last talk of the day is Artificial Iris by Dr. Mitchell Patrick from Houston. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Let me get my window up here. All right. How am I doing? Great, you're on. Perfect, perfect. Okay, okay great. So um, I'm going to talk about artificial iris um, because at least in the United States, we finally have an option for this. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Sharma as well as Ashvin and Amar for inviting me to participate. And actually, one thing I learned today is that I've been to India as many times as Ike. I never would have thought that, but um, I was lucky enough to be there uh, this past January for the IIRSI uh, winter meeting, and that was a great time. So I look forward to my next uh, option to travel there. Um, so for us in the States, um, you know, life isn't fair because we don't really have a lot of options for uh, repairing or putting in implants to repair iris defects. Um, you know, both um, Optech and um, Morcher make iris segments that can be implanted into the capsular bag. And we used to have access to the Optech IOL that was a, you know, sutured IOL that had an um, iris aperture in combination with the IOL, but um, that we lost access to that several years ago. You know, but finally, we've uh, recently received access to this Custom Flex artificial iris, um, which is produced by Human Optics and it's indicated for the treatment of total or partial aniridia in adults or children. And that can be from multiple causes, congenital aniridia, um, but traumatic defects, uh, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of us by now have seen this device, um, but it's a silicone elastomer and it's got embedded pigments in it. Um, you can either fold it to or inject it into the eye. It comes in two models. Um, one model is, uh, just the silicone elastomer without any meshwork, but the other model has an embedded polyester meshwork, um, which you can kind of see there in the mid middle of the cross section of one of these implants. Uh, the nice thing about this is they're all uh, custom matched to individual patients. So if you've got a patient with a unilateral aniridia, um, they will, will take photographs of the fellow eye and then that will be custom matched. So they'll produce um, a, an implant uh, that is really individualized for that uh, patient. If you've got a patient with bilateral aniridia, then they can actually choose their eye color. So they can pick whatever design they want um, and they'll make the implant to match that. Um, since they're all individually created, there's a fair uh, lead time on this. It takes anywhere from uh, two to three months to get one of these implants. Um, they can be put in the capsule or in the sulcus. Um, if you put them uh, in the capsule or in the sulcus passively, meaning you just set it in front of an IOL that's in the eye, um, you don't need that uh, meshwork within the implant. If you're going to place it in the sulcus and use sutures to fixate it, or actually fixate it to an IOL and then fixate the IOL to the eye, then you need that polyester meshwork to provide a little extra support for the sutures that might be passing through the implant. Um, if you're going to inject it, you can actually do this through a 2.75 millimeter incision. So it can go through a small incision. Um, you need it to be a little bit larger opening if you're going to insert it with forceps. And you can usually get that in through a four millimeter incision. Um, so if you're going to fixate it in, inside the capsule, uh, you need a capsorexis that's uh, not super large, but, um, and you, but it has to be at least five to six millimeters. A little bit towards six is going to be a little bit easier. Um, the smaller, it's going to be a little bit tougher to get in. But you got to be careful. You don't want your rexus too big. Sure, it'll make it easy to get it inside the eye. But over time, as that capsule contracts, the prosthesis can actually be squeezed out of the capsule. So you have to be careful with that. Um, when you're implanting this, you're going to use Tripan Blue to stain the capsule so you can visualize it. One, to help you make your rexus. But two, after, say, you're doing this in combination with FACO, when you're done with your um, removing the cataract and implanting the IOL, 
when you're getting ready to put this in the eye, you're going to want to restain your capsules to help with visualization. Uh, the one thing you got to be careful for is in congenital aniridia. The capsules are known to be a little bit more fragile, and we know that Tripan Blue can actually make the capsule more fragile. So for those cases, we want to use ICG to stain the capsule. Sizing is pretty critical no matter where you put these in the eye. And when you're putting them in the capsule, if you're doing an adult eye, 10 millimeters seems to be a good size. Um, the prosthesis actually comes uh, larger than that, so you can tree fine it down to the appropriate size. If you've got a larger eye like a high myo, you want to increase the size of the, uh, the prosthesis, so about 11.5 millimeters is a good idea. You can do a, a UBM to maybe size the capsule, which might help you judge how big you want to make this. And then in a pediatric eye, you want it to be a little bit smaller, um, about eight millimeters. But if you size it too small, it can slide around in the capsule. You can enter and end up with a decentered pupil. So you have to be a little bit careful with that. You always want to put in a CTR because as I alluded to earlier, if the capsule contracts, uh, these can shift and be extruded into the anterior chamber. So you always want to put in a CTR. And then because you're putting an extra device in the capsule, um, in front of the IOL that you implant, you want to target about uh, three quarters to one diopter of uh, more myopia uh, than you want to end up with with your refraction. So this is a video that I'm going to show. This is a patient who has a 16 cut RK. So he's got an irregular uh, cornea. Um, he also, you can see, has had a traumatic uh, iridodia. Um, uh, traumatic iris defect here, as well as a, a dilated pupil. So this patient elected to go with um, cataract removal as well as implant of uh, this device. So you can see uh, we have a five to six millimeter rexus. We're dialing in uh, the CTR here. We just do this manually. We could use an injector as well. So we're restaining the capsule so we can better visualize it when we insert the implant. We're removing that with viscoelastic refill with more viscoelastic. Uh, the more viscoelastic, the better. So we're injecting this in. So you can see we can do this through a 2.75 millimeter incision. This is one without mesh work. Um, it takes a little bit of effort to get this open. We're going to massage it with a second instrument. And what we'll often need to do, or what we really need to do in each case, is come in with forceps. And we're going to use forceps to pull it toward the center and actually twist the forceps to decrease the diameter 90 degrees to the axis that we're trying to implant it. And it can require multiple iterations here to get this in. And you're using a second instrument to try to slip it under the capsule edge. And these techniques were developed by a lot of different people. Mike Snyder has been a big lead in this, as well as Kevin Miller. Uh, Ike's done a lot of work with these too. And they've kind of helped us learn what the best techniques are to implant these. Um, as you can see there, this patient has some ability to constrict this pupil. So I injected a little myostat at the end to constrict the pupil because I want to make sure that there aren't certain sectors that might constrict more and actually um, cross over into the aperture of the implant itself. And I did a few little sphincters or sphincterotomies there to prevent the iris from constricting a little too much. If you've got an atrophic iris and it's changing the color, and you're, it's, which might contrast pretty highly um, against the implant that's behind it, uh, you can actually remove some iris with the vitrector. Um, it's good to leave a little bit of iris all the way around peripherally, especially with sulcus implantation, which I'll talk about next. Um, but you can uh, you know, take your time and uh, gauge how much iris you're gonna remove to get your best cosmetic appearance. If you're gonna put these in the sulcus, um, Again, as I just alluded to, it's really good to have a 360 degrees of residual iris if you're going to put it in passively and you're just going to set it in front of the IOL. Um, when you size these, you want to measure the sulcus diameter with an intraocular ruler. Um, MST makes one of those. I think it's a Mike Snyder design. You'll see that in my next video. Um, and you want to tree fine or um, uh, make the implant about a half a millimeter smaller um, than the size of the sulcus diameter. So uh, you're going to suture at least one edge, one millimeter from the edge of the capsule. Sorry, I got a little visitor there. Um, and uh, you want to pass the suture at least one millimeter edge or from the edge of the implant. Um, you got to be careful if you're doing passive fixation, you can get micro movement, which can give you UGG syndrome. So you really want to, I don't, haven't really employed that myself. So if you're going to suture, um, 
the uh, implant. Um, Gore-Tex works really well. I think I favor Gore-Tex these days for most suturing um, of anything under a little bit of stress. But with all Gore-Tex usage, you really want to, these days, I think we avoid Hoffman pockets. Um, and again, leaving a little bit of native iris tissue helps to keep the implant from prolapsing into the anterior chamber. So even if you resect a little bit um, after you implant it, it's good to have some in there if possible. So uh, this is a video courtesy of Doug Koch. Um, you can see here, uh, this is implanted with an IOL. Um, so we've got a sutured CZ70 BD IOL here. So we've got a large incision to start out with to get that IOL in. So we don't have to necessarily stress as much about getting this through a small incision. So we're gonna pass our Gore-Tex suture through the same uh, paracentesis that we used to implant the IOL. And here we can just fold it in half. If we're gonna put it through a smaller incision and fold it in the eye, we're typically gonna fold it into thirds. Once we get it in there, we're gonna sweep it um, with a Sinsky hook or a second instrument and take our time unfolding this, making sure to get it under the peripheral residual iris tissue here. Um, and then we're gonna pass our Gore-Tex sutures again out through these paracentesis and tie it again. And uh, we can rotate our suture here. Now you, you can see there's a little bit of residual iris there that's a little bit darker. Um, probably that won't be that much, uh, that won't be that noticeable cosmetically, but you could remove a little bit of that if you want to with a vitrector to get a little bit more peripheral. I'm gonna finish up talking about fixating the implant directly to the iris and then, or I'm sorry, to the IOL and then suturing the IOL in place in the eye. Again, since you're using sutures with this and you're, uh, use, you wanna make sure you use the um, prosthesis that has the mesh embedded, the sizing is the same. You wanna tree fine at a half a millimeter uh, less than the measured sulcus diameter. Um, in the USA FDA study, the uh, implant was sutured to the IOL haptics, and then the um, IOL haptics were sutured in place in the eye. But you can also use belt loops, and that's what I'm going to show in the next case. Um, I've seen videos that uh, Ike's put out there also using belt loops. And to me, this is a nice way of um, putting the implant or attaching the implant, the IOL, to the iris prosthesis. Um, so a larger incision sometimes is required, um, but, and then you can actually fixate the haptics, um, again, either directly to the implant, like I'm going to show here, or if you're suturing the, uh, prosthesis to the IOL, then you can fixate the IOL also with a intrascleral technique, such as glued IOL or Yamani. Um, the, those can be a little bit more challenging because when that implant is sutured, um, to the IOL, it decreases your visualization a bit. So this is a case of a, a traumatic um, open globe injury that was repaired elsewhere. And you can see they got a good repair of the cornea, lots of sutures around the cornea, a lot of scarring here. Um, and you can see some underneath there, especially inferiorly, we've lost a lot of iris architecture. So we're gonna do a PK here. So we're gonna implant this open sky. So we're gonna have a very large opening with which to do it. First, we'll do a little bit of cleanup, which I'm not gonna show too much of, um, but we can see here, we've got our uh, flooring or ring in place. We did a temporary keratoprosthesis, so our retina colleagues could do a good vitrectomy. We're measuring with this ruler to, uh, to measure the sulcus diameter. We're gonna tree fine a half a millimeter less. Here I'm doing this by hand, but they make nice devices to make sure you're centered uh, with your trephination. Um, here I did belt loops where I made the uh, incisions perpendicular to the edge of the implant. You can see we've tucked the haptics through those little belt loops there. And now I'm gonna go 90 degrees and make my marks to pass my Gore-Tex suture, again, about a millimeter from the edge of the iris prosthesis. Uh, since it's open sky, this is actually pretty easy. We're just going in through four paracentesis we've made, we've made here, and we're gonna insert uh, the combination of the IOL. You can see the haptic passing through the prosthesis there. Um, we're going to tie slip knots here. I'm not going to tie this fully because my eyes open and I'm not sure of my tension here, but I'm just going to make a slip knot to anchor it in place and we're going to save that for later. I'm going to proceed with my PK here. And once I get my PK in place and the eye is, uh, the pressure is increased, then I'm going to tie off my sutures, get the appropriate tension, and I can rotate those Gore-Tex knots. We don't want to leave any Gore-Tex knot on the surface of the eye. And again, uh, Hoffman pockets are good to be avoided with this. 
So here we can see our before, and this is afterward after our sutures have been removed. Uh, patient had a really good cosmetic result. Unfortunately, they also had a traumatic macular scar, so their vision had improved, but it's still not as good as we would have liked. But the patient was really happy with this outcome. Um, so, you know, we've got multiple options for iris replacement outside of the U.S., but this is our really only option inside the U.S. at this time. Um, it's really um, actually a great device. Um, it's very nice that they can custom color it to match the patient's fellow eye. You've got several options for putting it in the eye inside the capsule, the sulcus, which you can leave passively or suture it, and then you can attach it to the IOL as well. But it is expensive since it is custom. In the U.S., it costs about $8,000 per patient. Uh, insurance coverage is improving, but it's still a hurdle we have to overcome. So with this said, I'll end. I'll thank you for your attention. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mitchell, for that uh, lovely presentation. And I think there are a lot of questions. We have been watched by 4,000 plus people on the Facebook, on the YouTube, as well as on the web uh, browser. And there are uh, 160 plus uh, questions or comments and lots of congr congratulatory messages from all over the globe. And uh, I think we'll start uh, the questions. So. Uh, some of them are very simple ones, like for Dr. Ike, uh, there's a question which says that is your encirclage also reversible, just like uh, single pass for throat pupillar plasty is? Yeah, I think like you heard earlier, it is. You can laser that suture uh, if you need to or cut it, so it can be reversible. I haven't had to do anything yet for any of my patients that I know of so far, but it can be done. I think keeping it three and a half millimeters, I think, allows us. I mean, I, I hear the biggest concern people who don't do this you've heard it already they're paranoid about peripheral retinal visualization uh, Mitch gave an absolutely beautiful presentation uh, on the human optics prosthesis and that pupil size uh, is you know it, around the same range there 3.35 millimeters I believe so um, you know our, our retinal surgeons had a problem to be honest with you and uh, slow depression as I said and wide field viewing is enough and it's not usually needed so uh, there's another question uh, like for you, which says that uh, uh, how many passes do you take uh, uh, in a given, uh, how many bites do you take in a given single pass? Is that anything fixed or do you just? For a circlage, I would say the, the, the more you can, the better uh, to avoid any little gaps and little spaces. Uh, I think per quadrant, uh, I think as you saw there, I think at least I take, a, I take at least five or six bites ideally for cerclage um, and you know again you have to decide on how the iris tissue is the bites are usually half a millimeter from the uh, pupil edge although if there's an area of atrophy I may go farther back uh, but that's usually what I end up doing now it's a little bit different if you're doing interrupted sutures in that case you expect you're going to have a dog ear or you're going to have a gap and you can go back and suture it uh, as Gorov showed nicely if there's a gap or there's a there's an area that's existing still uh, I must uh, I must congratulate all the speakers for a wonderful presentation. Uh, there's one thing that uh, many people like to know, and that is that uh, whether this procedure can be done in fakey eyes. All these procedures uh, that have been shown. What about to do in fakey eyes? So, so it is for all of you. So, like a yeah. rapid fire, you each yeah. or, each one of you can respond. You know whether you do it in fakey eyes or not, Gaurav. So I won't do it in a fakey eye, but I have done it in a ICL uh, eye, you know, where we had a Uret Zavalia syndrome. And uh, after that, we had a, you know, iris, which was, uh, you know, floppy and it was dilated. So I've done it on a, you know, I then ICL inside, but because that's kind of like a protection. So, but I wouldn't do it in a fakey eye. Priya, you have done? Priya? You, you have mute. to unmute yourself. Priya, you're muted. Sorry. She's in the water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, yeah, yeah, it is it is very tricky to do it in a fakey eye. Uh, to be frank enough, uh, coming up to the uh, iridodialysis and other things, we have always done it because there these cases are mostly traumatic in nature, or they might be iatrogenic in nature. But at that point of time, you are probably doing a cataract surgery or you are doing an anterior segment surgery. So yes, it is very tricky to do it in a fakey eye. I would. Or you would that. agree with that? Um, yeah, I would prefer to do it in a pseudo fakic eye, but I think Mahipal is uh, got a great trick also to do it in a fakic eye. But saying that one sentence, I want to say a couple of things I want to mention here is I had the great chance to meet McKennell, you know, the guy who first started this whole thing. And I was in Minneapolis with uh, Dick Storm's group once and 
I met him and he I asked him a question at the time that how do you get this idea he said I suddenly had a 16 year old child and he was phakic and just decided to pass a needle and did the first mechanical suturing you know which is a great man he is also I want to tell Gaurav later on can you please share the screen to show the OPL also Maipal can you tell us your trick for it yeah so basically this was a patient uh, uh, who had I have done that actually twice one was in a patient of ICL where we used to do a uh, at that particular time, a peripheral iridectomy and the peripheral iridectomy became a complete iridectomy. So for that particular case, we had a support of the ICL as Gaurav had. But this was another case who was a post-traumatic uh, uh, sphincteric atrophy of the uh, of the pupil and the pupil was dilated and he was having terrible problems uh, at that. So instead of making him, otherwise there wasn't any dialysis, etc. So instead of making him a pancake, what we did was that we put an equivalent of uh, the Indian ICL, which is the IPCL in the eye, uh, did the uh, four pass and did not tie the suture fully and took out the uh, IPCL uh, and then tied the sutures. So you had the support of the IC IPCL or an equivalent or an ICL uh, when you were passing the sutures. So under those circumstances, the lens was saved and there was no problem. The patient is doing pretty well. So that's uh, the trick that you can have. Obviously, you will be sacrificing the uh, lens that you are using. But apart from that, there is nothing. So you can use any power IPCL. That's not a problem. So you just put it in and take it out. It's uh, very easy to put it in and take it out. But use that as a scaffold. It's more like uh, what Amar described as an IOL scaffold. So you have an IPCL scaffold uh, for passing the suture. Uh, and before tying it, remove the IPCL. So I'll just answer very quickly. Uh, we, we've had a lot of experience, actually, believe it or not, in fake eyes. I know it's not the first, first place to look at, but we've done a large series. By large, I mean about 25 plus patients. Um, and I think uh, it can be done. It's just a matter of really the proper technique. I wouldn't do a sarcolage, mind you, uh, but multiple sutures or a small defect or a coloboma uh, can be done. We always warn patients about the risk for cataract, and you have to be in and out pretty quickly. I mean, the longer the eye is open, without even touching the lens, the longer the risk is uh, for uh, damage to the lens. So uh, it can be done. I would warn, I would have the usual warnings though, of course. Uh, this is for Dr. Vasavada, sir. Uh, if there's a patient who has an iris coloboma and also has an irido uh, fundal coloboma, then what would you suggest in those cases? Actually, I, until uh, Amar taught me this, I used to do the segmental implantation in the back of these colobomas which will cover the area and will uh, will works very well. So now you would, uh, anybody who would want to differ uh, from this, you would still go ahead uh, doing a uh, pupilloplasty for these cases? Yeah, we are doing even pupilloplasty. Even if there's a fundal coloboma, even if there's a fundal oh, yeah. coloboma? Even with the fundus coloboma, because we close that iris defect a little bit, which helps the patients a lot. Mish, there's a question for you. They're asking, uh, can this prosthesis be used for uh, albonic uh, albinism? Sure, I don't see why not. I think, again, you got to be careful with the uh, capsule integrity uh, when you're doing that, but um, sure. And this is something you don't, you know, you would not put this passively in the sulcus in a phagic patient. This is something you definitely need to remove the lens when you're doing this. And why would you want to avoid Hoffman's pocket, as mentioned by Dr. Mish and Dr. I.K. both? Uh, asking, oh, I'll answer that, because yeah, yeah, um, when you have a knot under, even if it's a deep Hoffman pocket, when you have the knot under the sclera, uh, they're very high risk for eroding um, superficially through that. And then patching that can be a real exercise in frustration. Um, putting in a, a avascular scleral patch over that or tutoplast, eventually um, the knot will typically erode through that as well. So you um, have to be very careful with that. Okay, so this is for Dr. Sohas Saldipurkar. Uh, in pseudo exfoliation, if there's a case of pseudo exfoliation, do you think the iris be will behave a little differently? How would you handle that? And also, uh, second condition is when you have iris depigmentation and it's kind of tribal iris. So would you want to do uh, what do you want to do these procedures in those cases? Uh, unmute. Mute, unmute. Mute. Uh, well, with regards to uh, pseudo exfoliation, uh, there should not be any problem 
dealing with the pure pill because pure pill is going to be uh, working okay on the contrary it will be a little smaller than normal at the end and uh, what was the second situation you said the second was when when you have a, a trauma and the iris kind of gets depigmented becomes friable then becomes difficult to handle also i know if if the defect at that stage uh, is uh, is not too much i would probably uh, just leave it like that but then uh, yeah, I, i have i have the experience of handling such friable iris for suturing in the past but uh, i obviously would not try a pupilloplasty of the kind that we do today where we really get to bring it very small but you can always take a suture in the periphery just to kind of get the, uh, the area smaller but it's difficult but i have had the you know i have tried in the past when the defect was larger with the indian make of those uh, uh, you know those uh, segments but somehow uh, you know the experience wasn't really good so i have just given it up so there is a question for anybody to answer how frequently iris repair done in status quo acute angle procedure glaucoma with very shallow ac i have done it in the past where very high pressure and uh, the pupil was all stuck and the angle was closed but uh, i haven't uh, been able to achieve the kind of results that amar has although the pressure has come down but over a period a tightly taken suture sometimes gives way but uh, amar i must tell you the pressure uh, does tend to stay low that's a great thing uh, there's one question regarding children uh, whether these procedures can be done in children and at what age you would like to do uh, any cut off or for any specific procedure the tumor Yeah, I'm doing it in in young children also. I want to also tell you once I had a patient who flew down from Canada for pupilloplasty for me, you know, and the patient had some iris tumor, and I when I saw the pupil it was pretty good, but they were having a recurrent problem. So I asked, who was the surgeon who operated you? The iris thing was looking so good, and it was I came at. I said, go to hell. I said, what this guy is doing? He's magic fingers. He had, and the, believe it or not, the patient was faking. It was a nine, ten year old child, you know. and i got a heart attack seeing it and i said listen i'm never going to do live surgery next to ike <laughs> i think rajesh you also have experience of doing it in children would you enumerate yeah i have done it uh, quite a lot in children i have combined it with uh, the endothelial keratoplasty is wherein i have to do it. you know these are single chambers when i do these blue dye techniques and then combine these uh, pupilloplasties so it works very well and uh, it is really very useful to have a good tamponade if you you know um, good a nice pupilloplasty so the air tamponade is very good and the results are quite good a couple of scenarios wherein i found uh, it a bit difficult that when there is partial iris atrophy and then in that case even if the edges they align very well but the point from where the suture is pulling the iris it develops a small hole kind of thing oh, okay. so these things uh, any <clears throat> tip for that the term uh i'm not if if it's small defect i don't think it'll make too much of a difference that's why mm -hmm. you can always suture up that defect one thing since you brought up this intraskeletal haptic fixation whether you're doing glued or yamane one problem you can get is an optic capture so a simple trick which i tell people is just put in air at the end of the procedure we do glued aisle if by chance i get an immediate optic capture on spot you understand i repeat the question sentence again i'll put in air if i get an optic capture with air inside the eye immediately i'll take out the air do my pupilloplasty fourth row so that my optic capture will never occur post operatively so as you said correctly so small children i'm very much comfortable in doing it uh, age is not a criteria at all when we are doing pupilloplasty so we are doing it at any age i get this one is going to what about visual fields in cases where you've done this so we know that visual fields once you start getting down to less than 3 mm can impact the uh, reliability of visual fields uh that being said ag again it's quite variable patient to patient uh so you might get some impact yes for a very small pupil like the pinhole uh pupil size but again uh from my experience when i'm doing typically these pupils they're not usually smaller than 3 3 and a half so the impact is minimal but yes if it's very small if it's going to be a 1 mm pupil then no doubt there's going to be an impact on the uh, on the peripheral vision and visual field but typically amar when you call it as pinhole pupilloplasty what is the size of the pupil 1.5 to 2 mm 
so uh, as ik is saying that fields will get uh... Uh, yeah we have tested that on our fields with 1.5 to 2 mm we have published it also our fields are not affected at all with 1.5 to 2 mm what can happen is the illumination in the room sometimes can come down that is a person you know if you make it too small and the person is uncomfortable so that's why what we decided was with jack holiday we made different pupil apertures before pre operatively we show them 1.5 mm 2 mm 2.5 we ask them what are they comfortable with depending on what they are comfortable with then we decide on the size of the pupil and we make it so okay. more than the field effect i think is the illumination which slightly would come down if you make it too small so don't make it too small no but typically ever since our post graduate days mm -hmm. when we were on pilocarpine we said reliability of the fields are not good correct yeah that that that, that, that is much? true i mean there 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 is some impact there's no doubt there's some impact the question is how clinically significant is it correct correct um and so i think that I, I would agree. I don't think it's that significant, but technically, yeah, no question. Once you get down to two and a half, two millimeter mm -hmm. size pupils, there, there's an impact on the uh, on the sensitivity. Okay. Uh, another question is that can we use nylon sutures? You need to need the proline because they are non biodegradable. So if you use the nylon, they are biodegradable sutures. So my suggestion to everyone is please use the proline sutures, and you can use ten zero proline or nine zero proline, whichever one you want. Is, uh, Amar, is there any preference when you okay. use 10-0, when you would use 9-0? Amar, I saw many videos using 10 -o, but I use 9-0 proline. Yeah. I also prefer 9-0 proline. So I also prefer, prefer 9-0 proline. Okay, so people want to know if it is okay with this much size of the pupil, can they drive? Oh, yeah, definitely. After doing a, getting a pupil plasty done? Oh, they drive very well. well are you, yeah, are you speaking can. about... Are you speaking about Indi Indian drivers? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think after a period of plastic, the only job they can do is to drive. Yeah. Gaurav, why don't you show the OPL uh, flyer? Yeah. yeah, I'll just upload. Uh, we have the new program coming up. Uh, I would just time. ask uh, Dr. Uh, Vasavada to say one last word. We've been struggling so hard all these years with the lens and the cornea and iris is something, you know, which is relatively new. So what would be your you know, take home message at the end. I, I think uh, we, the surgeon, particularly I have learned, we never paid attention to the iris repair and defects as much as uh, these experts, uh, Amar and uh, Priya and I can Mitch have taught us over the years. So I think let's start paying attention to this. And we're looking forward for that book, Amar, that you and Priya and Ashwin are bringing up. So that's, that's something we are looking forward. So and thank you for the opportunity. I, I must leave now. and. Uh, Thank you all Thank you. for educating so well. Thank you. And Dr. Soha Saldipurkar, your last word well, on how the iris is, you know, coming up or has already come up. Well, uh, every time Amar has come out with some one of these, uh, you know, new aces, it's only made life beautiful. In fact, we all were discussing some time back about uh, whether that person will be able to drive and this and that. Now, here are the eyes that are so desperately pure, poor, and with pinhole pupiloplasty, when they get 6, 9, and 6, 12, it's like heaven for them. So some of those small defects, even if they stay, doesn't really matter because their distant visual acuity improves so well. Amar uh, hats off to those, all those things. And, you know, we also were talking about these fakic eyes and suturing. The, the trocar uh, stuff, you know, when you combine with these suturing, it makes, uh, you know, pupil plasty even in a freaky eye so easy. Even the trocar concept, Amar, is a beautiful one. Thank you. Namrata, can I show the, yeah, uh, please, the please. OPL slide quickly and then we can, you know, go on with the... I'll quickly show this because uh, this is one of our, uh, you know, very big programs. So, Dr. Amar has uh, planned out this amazing international OPL. For the first time, it's going to be on the on the internet and you know everybody around the world is going to be sitting at their homes and you know doing this unique OPL and we have a great lineup of international speakers uh, you know uh, it's of course chaired by Professor Amar Garwal and Namrita and uh, we have uh, Dr. William Fishkind who's among these are the panelists below there Dr. Benny Jeng, Ron Kruger, Dr. Lalit Verma, Ron Yo, uh, Dr. Rajesh Sinha, Partha, Dr. Lahane and then we have four teams uh, from across the world and uh, this is happening on the April 28th, 6.30 p.m. India time. And these are the four teams. Uh, so we will have an amazing lineup. Uh, Dr. Rohit Omprakash, Dr. Jagatram, uh, 
Dr. Ragini Parekh, uh, Dr. Eric Donenfeld, and we just look at the amazing topics we are covering. So each person is covering a pre-assigned topic, which is going to be fantastic education. We have uh, on the Yamane technique, Dr. Brian Kim, uh, Dr. Mohan Rajan, Dr. Dean Wano, and then we have Dr. John Hart, Dr. Priya Naran, Dr. Mahipal Sajdev, Dr. Kevin Miller, Dr. Susan Jacob, Dr. Haldi Purkar, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, Patrick and then Dr. Namrata presenting. So we have a galaxy of lineup. This is going to happen at 6.30 p.m. on, on April 28th, India time and across the world. And of course, we have, we have to keep the audience involved. We are going to have an uh, online poll for the audience for the best team. So we will have the, you know, the web, web people have uh, set up a, a polling system for the best team, for the most innovative video, for the best educational video. And of course, for the best headgear, you know, to make it fun like OPL always is. So I think the only one who's going to have a little bit of a problem coming with the most amazing headgear is our president himself. But I'm sure he's going to innovate <laughs> as always. And uh, everybody else, of course, please come with your unique headgear. And uh, we'll miss Aiki with who has a natural, uh, nice headgear as well. <laughs> and uh, good luck, so good luck. April 28th, please do log in and uh, block your day, save your dates. Thanks, Namrata, for allowing me to pull that out. So I think uh, we conclude this webinar. I would like to thank all the people who were a part of it and uh, all the international uh, faculty that we had. Uh, we had all the speakers, Amar, Priya, Ashwin, Gaurav, Dr. I.K., Dr. Mitchell, uh, and uh, Dr. Suhas Haldi Purkar, Dr. Vasavada, who are our eminent uh, panelists. Then I would like to thank uh, AIOS President, Dr. Maipal Sachdev, and the Treasurer, Dr. Rajesh Sinha, again for being a part of it and gearing it through. Um, we are grateful to Johnson & Johnson, Mr. Jaswinder and uh, Mr. Gaurav uh, for their support at the back end and Kripal, Rakhi and Mr. Bhageshwar from the AIOS office. Uh, we were on YouTube, Facebook as well as on the web and uh, we have this exciting webinar which is coming uh, on the 28th and on the 29th we have yet another webinar and that is uh, International COVID web webinar where we've got international experts from all over the globe, which includes Japan, Dr. Kino Shita, Dr. Jodhbir Mehta from Singapore, Dr. Shudosh from US, and all over the globe, there'll be about nine uh, international experts from nine countries who would be talking about COVID, how they are facing it, and how they're going to come out of it, because all of us are on various stages of you know, COVID. Somebody's come out, come out of it, and we are still into it, so we'll be discussing that. So uh, stay home, stay healthy, stay safe, and you keep watching. Uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you very much, Namrata, for thank all you. you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. Thank you, everyone. Everybody. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, Ike. Thank you. Special Bye. thanks to Ike and uh, Mitch who uh, made it all this way. Yeah, yeah. yeah at such odd times. <laughs>